Good morning, everyone. It's, it's a privilege to speak to your, your first year state and citizen uh, course. And I would like to spend our time talking about something you won't be talking about during the rest of the course. During the part of your constitutional law course, when you speak about constitutional rights, you're going to be drilling down into the very, very important subject of how we define fundamental rights, which our constitution guarantees. What does freedom of expression mean? What does equality mean? What, what are the principles of fundamental justice that are guaranteed to it? any person who's life or liberty or personal security is put at stake uh, by the state. And uh, in law school, as in law practice, uh, the meaning of those rights uh, is both challenging and interesting and important. But what's equally important is how we go about enforcing those rights. Indeed, a right on paper is of little use, no matter how broadly interpreted, if our method for enforcing it is one which those who need the right the most can't access it at all. I'm going to use equality rights in the Charter Section, Charter Section 15, um, as the, uh, the specific right I want to focus on because it is the one right in the Charter which well before the Charter uh, we've struggled with how to enforce it uh, and we've had a parallel system uh, online both before and after the Charter uh, to enforce it, and it's one that's changed over time. It's been controversial. There have been uh, uh, vibrant debates, sometimes really tough debates. I've had the privilege of being right in the middle of those. I'm going to share the debates. I'm going to point out where I've been a partisan so you can uh, judge what I have to say with that fair scrutiny that a, a combatant deserves uh, to be subject to. And I'm going to try to suggest where we uh, what we've learned along the way. In the end, what we should derive from all of this is our lessons about what, better, what we need to do to do a better job of coming up with ways for uh, enforcing particular rights. So here goes. When you got to law school, and for people who may watch this video who aren't in law school and will never go there, their understanding of enforcing legal rights is typically uh, that which we do in court. You hire a lawyer, you go to court, you have a trial, witnesses testify, lawyers argue, a court decides, and if you're not happy, you appeal. That's the paradigm for enforcing legal rights that pervades what you study here at law school and pervades what non-lawyers understand about what rights are all about. But there's an entire body of law and an entire body of practice that is outside that structure. And it's called administrative law. You're going to touch on it a bit in this course and in your advanced studies in second and third year, you, you've got an administrative law course and then some advanced courses you can choose from to see where it goes. Let me give you a quick introduction of what it's all about and then we're going to apply it to the issue of equality rights. Well, administrative law uh, arose years ago as a body of law to study the situations where we've taken the implementation and enforcement of individual rights out of the courts. We've said, you know what, there are better ways to implement and enforce these rights to resolve disputes. The court system has some advantages, but it has some huge disadvantages, one of which is it costs a fortune and a lot of people can't afford to use it. Another problem is it's a rather stiff, rigid, formal system, and it may not work very well for disputes that need more flexibility. Its remedies that it can provide where there's been an infringement or denial of rights are potentially helpful, but potentially limited. Typically, a judge decides a case, and then they're done. We have a fancy Latin term. They're called functus officio. They're done. They can't, you can't go back and say, hey, we still have this problem. You've got to go start a new lawsuit. There's no ongoing oversight. There are many things, and, and, and often you end up with issues that you want to deal with that require not just technical legal interpretation like we teach you here in law school, but infusing decisions about public policy in an area where you want someone who, who knows something about that area, has some expertise in it, and can infuse that into the decision. It's not just a matter of looking for cases and seeing if there's a precedent on point. 
So from this came the idea that let's set up in some areas non-court regulatory structures. And administrative law is that body of law that overlays all of it, that says, okay, you can set up these different non-court uh, uh, structures, labor boards, welfare appeal boards, immigration and refugee boards, securities regulation type bodies, and so on. But courts will oversee to make sure that they stay within the bounds of the law, and that's what we learn in administrative law. Well, this is the route we actually went many decades ago in the area of enforcing equality rights. Long before we actually guaranteed equality rights in the Charter of Rights at all. Long before we knew there would be a Charter of Rights in our Constitution. How did it start? Well, it started, the prehistory is, uh, as I take you on this tour, uh, the prehistory comes after World War II. World War II brings to shocking public attention the kind of harrowing brutality and, and cruelty that can arise from racial and religious discrimination. This led some provinces, like Ontario, to decide to make it illegal to discriminate based on race or, or religion in certain activities, like access to public accommodations. The way they did it initially was not by turning to non-court regulatory regimes that are the stuff of administrative law. Instead, what they did was they simply made it illegal and had it prosecuted through the courts as a provincial offense. It wasn't a federal criminal offense, it was a provincial offense. So you'd lay a charge, the Crown would prosecute, the police would investigate, and at the end a judge would decide and the penalty could be a fine or something. Uh, this system didn't work. And it didn't work for a bunch of reasons. In summary, courts are not experts in human rights and equality rights nor are Crown's uh, prosecutors or police. They're busy working on murders and sex assaults and break-ins and armed robberies. And when you add to that docket, uh, you wouldn't uh, rent this apartment to me because of my religion or the color of my skin, it didn't exactly leap to the front of the line in terms of priorities. Moreover, the prosecution process was not a way for uh, uh, making progress in relationships between those who are victims of discrimination and those who engage in it. It didn't constitute a really effective way of changing how society uh, works. And as a result, we go from prehistory, the 40s and 50s, to a transformative change, the next step. And it starts around 1960 or 61, and it starts here right in the province of Ontario, and then it spread right across the country. It was the introduction of the idea of taking this out of the courts. Let's take discrimination cases out of the courts. Let's create a regulatory regime for dealing with them. And the first version of this, which started in 1960 or 61 in Ontario, continues to this day uh, in a number of parts of the country, but not Ontario, and continued in Ontario till about uh, 2008, is a regulatory approach with a public enforcement model. What did they do? They created, the legislature passed a new law called the Ontario Human Rights Code. Human rights is the Canadian legal term for anti-discrimination protection. In other parts of the world, human rights is a term that may refer to all sorts of uh, fundamental civil rights and liberties, freedom of expression, freedom from torture, and so on. But in Canadian legal speak, it means uh, anti-discrimination laws, protecting equality rights. And the Human Rights Code set these rights out. It provided you can't discriminate in employment or housing or access to uh, services or facilities. Later, they added goods. And it lists the grounds of discrimination that were, for, were forbidden. Initially, race, uh, religion, and a few others. Since then, others have been added, uh, such as disability, sexual orientation, receipt of social assistance, and so on. But they provide the code of actual rights. But then the Human Rights Code goes further and provides the rules for how they're going to be enforced. And the Ontario Human Rights Code in the early 1960s, the first in Canada, took the implementation and enforcement of these rights basically right out of the courts. 
And instead, it created two new bodies to be responsible for their implementation and enforcement. The first was called the Human, Ontario Human Rights Commission. And the second was an adjudicative tribunal, then called the Human Rights Board of Inquiry, now uh, more accurately called the uh, uh, Human Rights Tribunal of Ontario. Different name, same basic role. So, how did it work? Well, the Human Rights Commission was this new administrative body with, which was designed to take into account the ideas I described uh, underpin administrative law. It was designed to bring to bear speed, expertise, and a capacity to bring policy concerns about human rights to bear in deciding cases, and to be able to provide a, a breadth of remedies better than courts can. So how did it work? The tribunal, or probably the Human Rights Commission really had two roles. And they're sequential. One role at first, a second, second. Let me walk you through them. At the first stage, the Human Rights uh, Commission is the neutral law enforcement body. If you felt you were discriminated against on a ground that the code prohibited, you thought that because of your race or religion or later your disability or, or sex or whatever, uh, was used against you in getting access to a job or a public service, or whatever, you could file a legal proceeding with the commission. It's called a human rights complaint back then. And the complaint was supposed to be less formal than a civil um, statement of claim or a criminal indictment. It's just a narrative of what happened to me. I applied for this apartment. They said uh, no Jews or uh, no blacks allowed, whatever they wanted to allege. I believe my rights under the Human Rights Code to freedom from discrimination because of my race or religion were denied, and that's it. Then we're off and running. The Human Rights Commission then became the, as I said, law enforcement body. How did it do that? It had several steps it was to follow under the legislation. First, it was to decide at the threshold, is this complaint one that we can handle? And it could turf the complaint out right at the front door without investigating on either of two grounds. Either it's a, it, the complaint's outside our jurisdiction, if you file a claim of discrimination but not on a ground that the Human Rights Code uh, bans, you're out the door. They have no authority to deal with it. Or if you file a complaint against a body that the Commission can't regulate, Provincial Human Rights Commission can't regulate Air Canada, that's federal. You try filing a complaint there, they turf it out the door. They don't investigate it, they don't do anything, they just say, sorry, we can't handle that. They could also turf a complaint right at the outset if they said it was frivolous or vexatious or brought in bad faith. What that means in plain language is there are some people who seem to just file complaint after complaint uh, in a uh, frivolous or vexatious way, uh, or there's some extrinsic proof that, there's, uh, that this is not a good faith claim, uh, they could uh, uh, turf the complaint. For complaints to get through that initial screening, the commission gets on to its next role. It had a duty to investigate the complaint. And the commission uh, had in its employ officers with investigation powers. Now, because this isn't criminal law, they didn't have to follow all the strictures that a police officer would because they're not looking for evidence of crime uh, that could send you to jail and so on. But their role was to go out and find out what the facts are, and they had some powers uh, that uh, uh, assisted them in being able to do that kind of investigation. After they investigated, then the commission had a duty to try to effect a settlement, in plain language, to try to mediate or negotiate with the parties, see if they can resolve the case. And in many cases, after investigating and, and sitting down with the parties, cases resolved by a settlement. And if they settle, case is done and the settlement is enforceable. In some other cases, they weren't able to infect the settlement. And then we get to the commission's really important role, and this is the stage where the commission goes from being a, uh, an investigative body, where it plays a neutral, to transforming to a new role. At this point, the commission, after it's tried to investigate, after it's tried to effect the settlement, the commission was mandated by the Ontario Human Rights Code to decide if the case 
warrants a hearing before the Human Rights Tribunal. Now, this is absolutely a pivotal, important power. If at that stage the case is settled, we don't get to this need for a hearing, it's done. It's settled. However, if the investigation is completed and no settlement can be reached, the Commission has to decide, well, what do we do? They got two choices. They can either essentially say, uh, we refer this for a hearing, in which case it goes on to the Human Rights Tribunal for a hearing. Or they say, we don't refer it for a hearing, at which point the case is over. It's done. The complainant, the person who brought the complaint, essentially goes away with nothing. And uh, the, if, on the other hand, there is a decision in favor of holding a hearing, the complainant can, then goes forward to a human rights tribunal hearing. So now we have transformed, we, we've now spent the commission's role as an investigator and as a party trying to neutrally mediate between the parties. We now shift to the next phase of the human rights public enforcement process, and that's at the tribunal. Now, to describe what happens that happened at the tribunal under uh, this system, I need to take a step away and draw a bright line between two worlds that you in first year law school know about and that the lay public know about. One is the courtroom in a civil case, and the other is the courtroom in a criminal case. In a civil case, like a lawsuit over a family law dispute or a breach of contract, it is a private lawsuit between two private parties, the plaintiff and the defendant. Each can have a lawyer, they hold a trial, they can each call witnesses, cross-examine each other's witnesses, and so on. The state is not there to enforce anybody's rights. It's a private dispute. I mean, the state can bring a private claim, but typically it's private party against private party. There's no state actor that comes in as the prosecutor or the enforcer. That's the private civil lawsuit model. At the other end of the spectrum is the criminal law model. In that case, the state is very much there. The Crown is there to prosecute the case, to call the evidence, to cross-examine the defense witnesses, and to try to prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. In the criminal case, the state is the prosecutor, and the alleged victim of crime is not a party to the proceeding. They're just a witness. They can't get up and argue the case. They simply answer questions that are put to them and then sit back down. In contrast, a, a, a plaintiff in a civil case is a party to the case. They not only can testify, they can cross-examine the other side, they can call their own witnesses, they can argue their case. So there's a huge difference between the role of the alleged victim of wrongdoing in a civil case versus a criminal case. Now let's look at what we can do in a creative regulatory regime when we're freed from the strictures of the rigidity of the court process. What the Human Rights Commission uh, Code did was to create a hearing process before the Human Rights Tribunal that was a blend of both a civil and a public or criminal model. At the Human Rights Tribunal under the old Human Rights Code, the party accused of discrimination, they're called the respondent, because they're responding to the allegations, they had a right, of course, to testify and to call evidence, to cross-examine the witnesses against them, of course. But as well, the complainant had the status of a party. They could testify, they could cross-examine the respondent's witnesses, they could make submissions to the tribunal of what should be done. But there's a third party at the hearing, and that was the Ontario Human Rights Commission. Well, what's it doing there? Well, under the old Human Rights Code, the Human Rights Commission was said to have carriage of the complaint. It's comparable to a Crown's role in a criminal case. So the Human Rights Commission could call evidence, cross-examine, and make submissions of what the tribunal should do apart from the complainant. And having carriage of the complaint, what that meant is the commission had the duty to present the case. But they don't present it as a private lawyer for a private complainant. 
They present it more in a public role, akin to a crown presenting a case at a criminal case. So we have a hybrid between a, a private civil dispute and a public criminal dispute. Now, it's not a criminal issue, but, but it's, it drew on that model. And I know this system well because I was, uh, at times, had the privilege of serving as counsel for the commission at some of these hearings. And when I brought my complaint against the TTC uh, to get them to announce uh, subway stops, something of which there's an entire video in this video lecture series, I was a complainant in two different hearings under this model. So I'm drawing on personal experience of what it's like. And at this hearing, the commission is no longer the neutral party it was during the investigation and mediation process. It's now there having investigated and deciding the evidence warrants a hearing to present the case. And now it's open to the complainant to say, I agree with the commission on some things, but I want some remedies they don't want, or I want to make arguments they don't want to make. Unlike a victim or an alleged victim in a criminal case, they're not simply a, a passive witness, they're an active party. Now, what's distinctive about this system uh, as it was designed was it was designed so that they could try to resolve cases through investigation and mediation where possible. The code allowed for remedies not only to compensate a victim of discrimination for their loss, but to prevent discrimination from recurring again. <coughs> and that could include ongoing remedies, the kind of things courts might not order. As well, this system brought to bear expertise at two levels. The Human Rights Commission, a publicly appointed body, was supposed to have expertise in human rights and discrimination. A better expertise in being able to determine where it's happened, whether it's happened, what should be done about it. As well, the Human Rights Tribunal, unlike courts, was supposed to be selected based on expertise in human rights. So it's not a court tribunal. It could be more informal, but it has this added expertise. The system was aimed to be faster uh, and more effective at promoting uh, human rights. And the key point that becomes controversial, as you'll find in a minute, the commission's decision whether to go to a hearing or not, before the commission can stand up at a tribunal and advocate that there was a denial of human rights here, it was expected that as a public body, law enforcement body, it would first look into the case, investigate, and try to settle it. And it would only go forward with the case if it's looked into it, gathered evidence, decided there's enough evidence to warrant a hearing, and dealt with a respondent that won't settle for an appropriate settlement. The final feature of this public enforcement model is that the Human Rights Commission, as I said, when it stood before the tribunal, was not simply there as like the free lawyer to the complainant. They were there to represent the public interest. So they, they could seek remedies, not only damages to compensate a person who lost their job as a result of discrimination, but to seek public remedies that the complainant might not even ask for or even want, but which are necessary to get the respondent to change the way they do business in the future. And under the old system, even if a, compl a, a complainant brought a case forward and a respondent said, here, I'll, I'll write a check for you, will you go away? And if the complainant said, yes, I will, the Human Rights Commission could still press the case forward because in the public interest, they wanted not just money for the complainant in the circumstances, but remedies that make sure this isn't swept under the rug, uh, remedies to ensure it doesn't happen again. So, great system. How to work? Well, mixed. And it was the subject, it was running uh, from 1960-61 onward, human rights cases got more complicated, the case load got bigger, new grounds of discrimination got added, like disability in 1982. I was involved in advocating for those legislative reforms just as I finished my studies uh, here at the Osgoode Hall Law School. Um, its workload grew, the complexity grew, the controversy around it grew, and what people found out over time was the, it, it, it was, some people were getting results, but it was mired in controversy. And the controversy from the respondent side, it was alleged the system isn't fair to us, it's one-sided against us. And from complainant side, from the side of equality seekers, the objection uh, that was made was it's too slow. It can take years to get a, uh, your case heard. You file a complaint. It can take years for an investigation to be done. 
It was argued the investigations were often not as good as they were needed to be. Um, and if you get turned away by the commission after an investigation, you're out of luck. This led to inquiries during the 90s, officially one federal, one provincial, into how to fix the system and various efforts at fixing it. And the various solutions were proposed. Nothing ended up fixing it. This culminates in the next phase in human rights enforcement, the most controversial. It uh, began uh, 11 years ago this month in February of 2006. And it is to that that I want to turn uh, now for a few minutes. The government of the day in Ontario, by the way, this model I just gave you uh, spread across Canada, it was stopped federally and in uh, all the other provinces. Uh, and problems that uh, I, I just described were replicated elsewhere. Uh, well, as of 2006 in Ontario, there had been uh, recurring concerns about the system. And uh, this led the Ontario government of the day under then uh, Premier Dalton McGuinty and Attorney General Michael Bryant leading the cause to come forward and say, we got to fix it. We want to come up with a complete revamp of how human rights will be enforced. The stated reasons for it were to speed it up uh, because justice delayed is justice denied for victims of discrimination. Um, and so, the, but what became controversy is what the fix would be. Well, the fix that the, what I'd like to describe is those, uh, first, the case that was made for reform by those who pitched the new reform then the response against it by those who were against it, I was one of the loud folks who was very much against it. What the government did about the criticisms that we raised, what was enacted, and then how it's working. So, what was the call for reform? Well, interestingly, the call for ref the need for reform was, I think, unanimously recognized by lawyers who advocated in human rights cases or who advocated for equality seeking organizations. We all agreed the system was broken, but we disagreed with why the system was broken. Um, there were uh, those who said the system design was fundamentally flawed. That was the other side of this debate. And there were those of us who said the design is okay, but it needs to be uh, mended and improved. So those who, and, and we lost this debate, those of us on my side lost the debate. Those who were arguing for change, this is a group of lawyers who do human rights uh, cases. One thing united all of us is we all had an equally passionate commitment uh, to human rights. Uh, we just disagreed on this, uh, both the cause of the problem and the solution. Um, they used to meet in mornings to uh, sometimes to formulate their ideas they got the nickname The Breakfast Club, and which is very interesting because when the government came forward with its uh, bill, those of us who united against it uh, decided to call ourselves The Supper Club. And we actually had one meeting together to see if we could broker, and we actually called that meeting The Lunch Club. <laughs> Sadly, it didn't work. But So what were The Breakfast Club folks? A and everybody was genuine human rights supporter. It's not like anybody was saying, you know, we support it more than you do. We agreed that the system was too slow, but the, the Breakfast Club folks said that there was a design flaw. And here's what their argument was. They said the problem with the human rights system under the old human rights code was that it did not guarantee to complainants, alleged discrimination victims, a right to a hearing before the tribunal. In other legal systems, including civil law, you file a claim, you can go to court. And they said what people should be able to get is a hearing where they can stand up and make their case. Indeed, they said the problem was the Human Rights Commission got in the way. It was a multi-year delay for investigations that at times, often, they argued, were not well done. And the complainant was put in the disadvantage that if they, they could have the commission turn them away, say that we've investigated, it didn't settle, but we don't think this case warrants a hearing, they were a gatekeeper to the system, and it was argued there should be no gatekeeper. And if you're turned away, you lose, and you never got a hearing. And they said that's both paternalistic and wrong. 
And they said, if we could only get rid of the gatekeeper and send these cases right to the tribunal, we'd cut out years of delay, get rid of arbitrary unfairness, let people control their own case, and get rid of bureaucratic paternalism. And it, it sounded like a compelling case. But those of us on the other side didn't think so. So I'm going to give you our side. Now, in fairness, as I describe both sides, I'm trying to be, I used to be a crown, I'm trying to be fair to both sides, but I have to be candid. I thought they were wrong, as did my colleagues. So uh, the, what was the supper club claim? And by the way, if you go to aodaalliance.org and look at the human rights reform link, you'll see the whole history of this uh, played out. We said that there will always be a gatekeeper in any system. You can't get rid of a gatekeeper. Every legal system has one, either de facto or as a matter of law. So it's illusory to think you're going to get rid of one. The second thing we said is that the problem with the old system can be fixed by two fixes. One, fund it better. If you've got this huge case law, and if it's gotten more complicated, give it more money so it can do its job rather than starving it and saying it's got design flaws. And as well, we said, if there's a problem with the gatekeeping role in how it's being discharged by the commission, mend it, don't end it. Come up with a more expeditious process, come up with a fair process. If people want a chance to, if the commission is thinking of turning someone away after investigating, let someone have a hearing before the commission. It can be an informal one, it's not a full trial, but if they want to have a face-to-face -face chance to be heard, the breakfast clubbers said you could get turned away without the people deciding, ever even meeting you, much less hearing from you, let them meet. And we put a proposal forward. But we also said there were two other problems with the breakfast club uh, proposal, with the idea of going directly to the tribunal and taking the Human Rights Commission offline. The first problem, uh, the, the first of these, was that it will privatize human rights enforcement. <laughs> Under the pre-existing regime, we had a public enforcement model. There was a, you the individual brought your case to a Human Rights Commission, they had the duty to investigate, they had the duty to publicly try to affect a mediation, and if they can't resolve the case and the evidence supports it, they have the duty to take it to a hearing and play the role akin to a public prosecutor and to seek remedies in the public interest, not just in the complainant's private interest. And we argued that that's fundamental to effectively resolving uh, problems of discrimination in our society, that if we take the public enforcement out of enforcement, we lose a lot. The, uh, the other com of our um, criticisms of, of, their, of the Breakfast Clubbers proposal was, we said, there's a bit of a problem here, which is right now under the current, or right then under the old system, when a case went to the tribunal, there was the Human Rights Commission to present the case. Under the new system, who's going to investigate? Who's going to represent complainants? These folks come from equality-seeking groups, dis people with disabilities. Uh, racialized communities uh, and, and others who are systemically and historically disadvantaged. For them to go out and privately investigate, have to hire lawyers, is just not realistic so much of the time. Respondents, typically government, municipal transit authorities, municipalities, big corporations, and sometimes smaller companies, they're more likely to get all lawyered up. You'll have very unfair hearings if they're lopsided, one under, on one side unrepresented and on the other side represented uh, and well legally armed much of the time. So that, the issue was joined. So what happened? Let me take you through the first phase and then we'll, we'll take a break. So in February of 2006, then Attorney General Michael Bryant announced at a news conference that they were going to come up with this new reform, that they were going to have direct access to the Human Rights Tribunal. And when the question that naturally flows from that, of who's going to represent uh, complainants in the system, 
he said there will be representation, but there were no specifics. Controversy immediately broke out. Those of us who rallied against it came together to speak out against it. Those who were in favor spoke in favor. There were debates in the legal community. There were de debates in the media. A bill was introduced and there was controversy throughout. At this point, I put on my community organizer hat. I was not the chair of the AODA Alliance, the coalition I now serve as chair, but I was appointed to serve as its human rights uh, law reform representative to lead uh, its voice on this. Um, and we uh, got to work. We built uh, bridges with and relationships with folks uh, represent racialized, uh, racialized communities um, and others. That's when the Supper Club was uh, born by somebody inviting us all to get together and we started collaborating. Again, on our website you can see how the debate unfolded, but I'll just take you through a moment of the legislative procedure. Uh, as this issue was working its way through the legislature, we decided to use the legislative procedure to help focus the debate and mount our opposition to this legislation. And to do that, we pleaded with the government to agree to hold public hearings. When a bill passes second reading in the legislature, they can appoint a committee uh, to study the bill, including inviting the public to make deputations. That is a way to rally people to come forward. We asked for two things. Number one, will you hold hearings and do it around the province? And number two, government, will you commit that everyone who wants to get here heard will get hurt? And the answer or the result of our efforts was they said, yes, we will hold hearings, and yes, we will hold them around the province, and yes, we will agree that everyone can get hurt. Of course, it's hard for a government to say, no, we won't let everybody get hurt when the bill relates to something as fundamentally human rights. Did I mention there was an election coming the next year? <laughs> so we then focused our efforts on the hearing to get folks to go there uh, and uh, raise the concerns uh, we have raised that I've just summarized. And of course, the folks on the uh, other side of this debate did the same thing. And on our website, we analyzed the presentations that were made at the legisla uh, legislative hearings. And as the summer and the fall unfolded, especially outside Toronto, a significant majority of the presenters uh, were closer to our side than the pro-bill side. Um, and what happens when the government sees uh, a, an issue like this coming up uh, in a standing committee or in a legislative proceeding is they got to figure out like what are we going to do about it? We got to have a response line and we had focused our message on this who's going to represent complainants issue because that actually united every I should say everybody but lots from the equality seeking community because even folks who liked the idea of the proposed reforms um, a number of them shared the concern that sending an unrepresented a victim, alleged victim of discrimination into a hearing against a lawyered up um, a respondent is not a fair fight uh, and is not going to be uh, something that will uh, work better for us. Well, when the government sees this, they write a script and they give it to their members of the legislature to read out during hearings. And that's exactly what happened. And in response to a number of these depute, uh, presenters at hearings around Ontario, you can find this up on our website, uh, the, the stock line, I'm paraphrasing, that was given is the government has promised that they will, uh, through amendments or whatever, that they will ensure that every human rights applicant has free public lawyer throughout the process from beginning to the end. Now, on the one hand, you might think like chicken in every pot and a free lawyer for every claimant. Uh, is that realistic? But it was a natural question for people to ask, and the government's knee-jerk response was to promise, don't worry, we'll fix it. And this became then the fo a focus of the debate. The fall came around, fall of 2006, and the lineup for the hearings got bigger, and two things happened before the bill was passed that are significant. Uh, the first is the government, now 11 months away from an election, did something quite unique. It, uh, I shouldn't say unique, unusual. It passed what's called a closure motion. It used its majority to say, the debates at the hearings at the committee and the debates before the legislature are going to be time limited. We're shutting down debate. We'll allow a couple more days and then that's it. And of the many groups that actually had booked presentations before the standing committee and then had them canceled by this closure motion was the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act Alliance, my coalition. 
And there was actually a day where you could pick up the newspaper, on the one hand, read a newspaper article slamming the government, an editorial, for canceling hearings on a human rights reform bill. And on another page, you'd see an ad for hearings for the human rights uh, bill because they'd placed the ads and couldn't yank them quick enough. <laughs> the average onlooker, it looked a little weird. Um, so that was one of the two strange things uh, that happened. Um, the other strange thing that happened uh, was that the government came forward with a package of amendments, as they said they would, as a result of the hearings. And they included amendments to address this core issue of who would represent uh, complainants. What they didn't propose was that the government would provide free public lawyers for all human rights applicants from beginning of the process to the end, the very thing they said they'd do. Instead, they proposed creating a new legal clinic. It's called the Human Rights uh, Legal Support Center. And it would be available to provide advice and representation to human rights claimants. It exists to this day. If you do a human rights uh, intensive program, you'll get placed there. They are fabulous people. And while I disagree with the regime overall, I <coughs> have nothing but praise for these folks and their dedication and their efforts. Um, and I encourage you to consider it, uh, uh, a placement there. Uh, but in any event, they created this center, but they didn't ensure that it would be able to serve everybody. Drawing on community organizing skills that at Osgood I, I try to infuse into lectures like this, uh, we tried to come up with amendments that would put the government to the test. And we got the opposition to propose an amendment to the bill, amendment to their amendment. Their amendment said we're going to create this center. We got an amendment proposed that would, would say the legal, excuse me, the legal Support Center would provide free government lawyers, publicly funded lawyers, for every human rights applicant from beginning of the process to the end. Their actual promise. The amendment was actually defeated by the government, voting down their own, voting against their own promise. The bill passed. Now, before we break, I want to add one uh, important layer to the debate. And after the break, we'll talk about how, um, how it's worked since uh, it passed at the end of 2006. The debate I've, I've described to you is a debate about whether we'll have a public enforcement or a private enforcement regime. It's a debate of looking at two different ways of enforcing equality rights. It's not a debate over what the equality rights guarantee or who should enjoy them. It's simply a debate about how do we make it work? We've taken them out of court. What regulatory system would work? And the debate between the two sides boiled down in no small part to a debate over whether the Human Rights Commission was fixable or was hopelessly incurable. If you thought it was incurable, you were likely to say, get rid of it. If you thought it was flawed but fixable, you might be more inclined uh, to the side of the debate I was on. But there was an added disability perspective on this, and that's what I'm going to just spend two minutes on for you. In other lectures in this video lecture series, and other times when you hear me speak at the, at the law school here, um, you'll hear about the fact that from 1994 to 2005, I and others got together to fight for the creation of a new law passed in 05, the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act. It was a new regulatory law aimed at requiring organizations, public and private sector, to tear down the barriers, the accessibility barriers that impede people with disabilities, without us having to litigate them under the Human Rights Code, without them having to go through what I did, having to take two cases against the Toronto Transit Commission, once to force them to announce subway stops, and another to force them to announce bus stops for the benefit of we blind people. Well, that law was there to try to, we fought for that law to try to uh, make human rights become a, re a reality for people with disabilities without them having to go through any of these kind of case-by-case -case battles. It wasn't to replace the Human Rights Code, it was there to, um, um, to reinforce it and make it become a, rea make them become, uh, a reality in our lives. Well, during that decade-long debate over that uh, accessibility law, 
the question came up about how those rights would be enforced. Now we get back to this debate I'm telling you, uh, this human rights reform debate. You see, everything I'm going to tell you about over the next two minutes predates the human rights privatization reform. And what happened is when the government turned to us in 2002, 2003, 2004, 2005, said, how do you want this new Disability Act enforced? We said, we'd like an independent arm's length enforcement agency created for it. Now the government passed the accessibility law in 05, the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act, and they put enforcement powers in it, but they didn't create an independent enforcement agency. And they said they didn't do that because we still have resort to the Human Rights Co Commission to enforce our rights if we need an independent agency. And we shook hands on that in 05. We said, you passed a good accessibility law, it's not everything we want, but it's real progress. Months later, in 06, along comes the same government that rips out the Human Rights Commission as the key public enforcement independent body. We said, that's not fair. That's undoing a deal. And, uh, and, and that's a real step backward for people with disabilities beyond the harm that we argued this reform, the human rights reform caused for everyone, for everyone in the equality seeking community. So let's take a, a, a five minute break now and then when you come back, let's talk about how it works. Which side of the debate was proven right? Welcome back. I, uh, if you read anything on this entire debate, by the way, you'll often see it referred to as the Bill 107 debate. Uh, and that's because the bill that was introduced to amend the Human Rights Code in 2006 and it passed at the end of the year after that closure motion uh, was Bill 107. So how's it working? Well, you would expect those who argued in, for it, uh, in favor of it to simply say we were right and those who were against it would just say we were right. And to the extent, some extent there's, there's a measure of that. But we do have practical experience uh, to turn to. Um, and speaking for myself, as I endlessly do, um, I've always been prepared to be wrong. In fact, I would be happy to eat crow and say, you know what, in good faith we had these concerns, but it worked out better than we thought. Uh, this is not a, an ego investment or something. And the way we could have been proven wrong uh, was uh, w uh, easily uh, was this. You see, under the old system, you remember I said that the Human Rights Commission was the one who brought all the cases to the tribunal. Um, the ones they didn't resolve and the ones that they thought uh, warranted a hearing. The Human Rights Commission brought somewhere between 50 and, I don't know, 150 cases a year of the many more complaints uh, that they received. Some of those cases were groundbreaking public interest cases like my case against the TTC, which had ramifications for route stop announcements and public tra transit authorities, not just in Toronto, but elsewhere in Canada. Um, other cases that really pushed the outer boundaries of equality and made a lasting impact. Other cases were just one-off disputes between the parties, which had no sweeping precedential significance. Um, if, and under the old system, the Human Rights Commission actually had the power to initiate its own cases, even if it didn't have an individual complainant. If they, through general feedback, found there was a recurring discrimination problem, they could, they could carry on. Now, under Bill 107, the Human Rights Commission was not abolished. It was just radically downsized in terms of its size and its duties. Its new role would be principally as a, to develop human rights policies, to educate and advocate on human rights, but it also had a reduced power to bring what the, uh, its proponents called systemic discrimination cases. Now, here's where I could have been wrong. I and my colleagues who were uh, opposed Bill 107. Uh, we could have been wrong if, under the new system, the Human Rights Commission brought to the tribunal as many cases as it brought under the old. And if they were all public interest cases, not one-off he said, she says, but all public interest cases, and I'm not disparaging the one-off cases, they're important, but if they were all groundbreaking, 
And if in addition to that, the Human Rights Tribunal got the, the added load of cases from the Human Rights Legal Support Center, then I'd have to say, you know what, there's more human rights justice being administered. And if it's, it turns out to be quicker, I'd have to say, it's also quicker. And while our fears were genuinely expressed, we were wrong. Well, how's it work? Well, under the, the, a number of those who were the lead proponents for the new bill ended up in leading roles implementing it. And that's, that's the way it should be. They were uh, the, the uh, creators of the ideas. They would be the most passionate about making sure it worked. Um, and credit to them to take on those roles. Um, we have a chance to assess, we had a really ch a good chance to formally assess how it was working because one of the few things we got in the Bill 107 debate was a beefed up provision requiring after three years on the books that the government would have to appoint an independent review to consult the public and report on how it's working. Then it wouldn't be us just hypothesizing what might happen, uh, but what did happen. That review was conducted, uh, it was appointed uh, the bill went online in 08. The review was appointed in 2011, held hearings in the spring of 2012, and reported that fall. Um, and you can see in the materials I've given you for the class and on our website, we made detailed submissions to the re independent review, and uh, we provided an analysis of its report. Just one moment on the review, and then I want to spend my time on the, on, the, uh, on the content of what everybody had to say. Um, we had concerns about who conducted the review. Before the review was appointed, one of my colleagues representing another commu uh, community interest, uh, community group, wrote the then Attorney General Chris Bentley and said, whoever you appoint to do this review should have expertise in human rights, but they should not have been one of the proactive participants in the Bill 107 debate on either side. We'd like this to be an independent look. Let the facts speak to an independent uh, mind. The government didn't listen, and they appointed a fellow to conduct the review named Andrew Pinto. I have a lot of respect for Andrew. He's a very good lawyer. He's a dedicated human rights lawyer. He has great expertise, and he really cares. I don't question his commitment or his abilities, but he was one of the active proponents for this bill. In fact, when we, the AODA Alliance, held our first news conference to unveil our criticisms of the government's proposals, he and a couple of his colleagues came to our news conference at Queen's Park to tell the media why we were wrong. Now that's democracy, that's fine, that's fair game. But that's not the person to whom we should be turning three years later and saying, here's why we have concerns. Um, nevertheless, I don't want to make personalities an issue, and I emphasize that I have a lot of respect for him and the work he did on the commission, on the independent review. But here's what was, what, what was presented to the independent review. From the point of view of those who thought the system, uh, who advocated for it or thought it was working well, they said, under the new system, things are quicker. Under the new system, you get to the human rights tribunal quicker. Um, and uh, things are really moving forward. Uh, for those who were concerned, and the AODA Alliance was among those, and we filed a brief with Mr. Pinto on March 1st, 2012, which I've provided for you, and we'll put a link to it with this lecture. Uh, it's a brief that a good number of other community groups endorsed. Uh, we provided, I think, the most thoroughgoing uh, critique of the system. Here are the concerns we raised. First, we said that the government has not met its commitments on this bill. They promised that under this bill, everybody would get a hearing on the merits before the Human Rights Tribunal within a year of filing a complaint. And that deadline wasn't met. As for those, we said, who argued the new system is faster, the fact is there was a substantial increase of funding to the new system. And so it can't fairly be said that the speeding up of the system was due to the new system. If you'd given that same money to the old system, it might have been just as fast, maybe even faster. We don't know. But it's wrong to say that any 
uh, speeding up is due to a new enforcement regime. We argued that the concern that we raised in 2006 about legal representation has turned out to be absolutely true. Reports from the Legal Support Center and from the tribunal showed that a significant majority of those who actually appear as applicants, as discrimination claimants, were unrepresented, whereas respondents were disproportionately represented. The Human Rights Legal Support Center in its earliest years couldn't even answer all the phone calls it was getting. The, there was reports of people having to hang up. They couldn't stay on the queue long, long enough, uh, uh, wait long enough on the queue. Now, the Legal Support Center has substantially improved that process from what we understand. But nevertheless, that was the situation. But none of that, those who go to the Legal Support Center, um, a significant proportion of them can get advice or maybe help partway through the process, but they don't get full independent legal representation throughout the process. Some do, from what we were told, many if not most don't. So a commitment made to us was lost. But there were other problems as well. We were told the Human Rights Commission would become a strengthened presence before the Human Rights Tribunal, bringing its own cases or intervening in individual ones freed up from the burden of having to go through all the cases that used to come to its front door. In fact, it virtually never in the first couple of years went to the tribunal. It's increased somewhat, but it's certainly nothing like what it used to be. With respect to the process at the Human Rights Tribunal, concerns were expressed that the rules reformed after the Bill 107 was passed, were too complicated for lay people to navigate. The old rules were designed for lawyers because typically the cases were presented by commission lawyers and respondents quite often had counsel. But now we're in a new world where you at least have one side unrepresented much if not most of the time. You need a whole different kind of rules to be fair to them. There are other problems. The old system had a substantial regime for public accountability. The Human Rights Commission was a public agency and senior commissioners were appointed by the government to represent perspectives and expertise in human rights. I'm not questioning the commitment and expertise on human rights at the tribunal or the legal support center, don't, don't get me wrong. But the Human Rights Commission rendered an annual report publicly, which gave a complete picture of the system with all its warts. You knew how many cases were in it. You knew the resolutions because they almost never signed a confidentiality clause. You knew what public remedies they got, what private remedies they got. You knew how long the delay was. You knew everything by looking at one document. Under the new system, it's not like that because some Complainants go to the Human Rights Legal Support Center. Some go to other people to represent them, legal clinics or private lawyers. Some go on their own. Some settle cases privately. There's no one place that knows and makes public all the resolutions. Moreover, the Human Rights Legal Support Center, and I don't mean any criticism of this by, by what I'm going to tell you, they um, often agree to confidentiality clauses and settlements. Now, in private litigation, that can happen a lot of the time. But the Human Rights Commission, when it handled these cases, had a public accountability role, which led them to be public most of the time in what resolutions they reached. So we were able to look at the old system and know what public interest remedies they got or didn't get against who. On the new one, if a client agreed to it being public, the Legal Support Center can make it public, but if they don't, the Legal Support Center has a professional duty to keep it confidential. Moreover, under the old system, even if, as I explained uh, before the break, even if the claimant and the respondent want to settle a case for some cash or whatever, if the Human Rights Commission wanted more remedies in the public interest, they could insist on it. Under the new regime, yes, the Legal Support Center can recommend to their clients to seek public interest remedies, and yes, 
clients can agree to seek it, but if they either don't want to or the client or the respondent doesn't agree, they still can settle with none of them. And we can't police it from monitoring it to know whether we're getting better or worse results than we used to. Now, I'm not accusing anybody of cover-up or any of that kind of stuff. The Legal Support Center is more in the role of a private law firm in this case in relation to their clients, not of a law enforcement agency. There are other problems. There is a huge problem um, that we reported, and I don't know that it's ever been fixed, regarding the enforcement of settlements or, or of orders. Under the old legislation, the Human Rights Commission had the power to enforce, and if a party didn't comply, they could take them to court. Under the new system, it's, uh, it's up to the individual. There's no public enforcement of remedies. And so we're left to worry how, much, how many of the remedies are being complied with, settlements or orders, and if not complied with, what's being done about it? I can tell you from all of my disability rights advocacy, enforcement is pivotal to everything. And being able to see what's really going on across the system with enforcement is pivotal to enforcement. There are still other problems. Remember I said that the critics of the old regime said it was wrong to have a gatekeeper. Those of us on the other side said, look, under the new system, there's going to be a gatekeeper. Like, don't kid yourself. There's going to be one. Well, we've argued that there is. In fact, there are two. Here's how the argument goes. Number one, the Human Rights Tribunal has the right to dismiss a case up front under some discretionary basis if it sees the case um, is essentially meritless. That's a kind of gatekeeping role or outside its jurisdiction. I'm not going into the technical language, but it is a capacity, a limited capacity, but to throw cases out without a hearing on the merits. So we got one, and it's a legal one. If they throw it out, it's out. But there's a second gatekeeper, uh, we argued, and that is the Human Rights Legal Support Center. Now, it's not in law a gatekeeper, but as a practical matter, we argue, for many, it is. If the Legal Support Center decides not to take your case, many will just go away. For them, it's over. Now, those who are on the other side of this debate will say, hey, Lepofsky, there's a huge difference. Under the old system, if the Human Rights Commission turned a case away, said, we're not referring this to a hearing, we've investigated it, we've tried to mediate it, we think it doesn't warrant a hearing. At that point, the complainant is sunk. They cannot go to the tribunal. And in response to our complaint, the critics of, of my position would say, under the new system, if the Legal Support Center says, sorry, we can't represent you or we won't, we either don't think you got a case or we don't have the resources, um, we, the individual can still either try to find a private lawyer or a legal clinic or go on their own. And they argue, some do. But we argue, some do, doesn't disprove that for many, they won't. And so that functionally, the Legal Support Center is becoming the very gatekeeper that the proponents of Bill 107 said we should never have. De facto, not de jure. Now as well, uh, those of us who've uh, criticized uh, the new system, uh, we argued that there is an added problem that the Legal Support Center has created, <coughs> actually two, but they've done it, in, in, as with everything they do, in good faith. For one thing, the Legal Support Center has said they want to bring some test cases or set some priorities because of what they see re repeatedly coming in the door. Now that makes sense because they've got limited resources, they see what comes in the door, uh, and so on. However, that's exactly what the Human Rights Commission used to be. They're de facto, what they're in effect acknowledging is the old system kind of had the right idea. But in the old system, it was a public agency, not a private, uh, uh, well, I shouldn't call it a private legal center, but a government-created legal center with a government-appointed board of directors, but without the kind of uh, public oversight and scrutiny that you would get 
when a Human Rights Commission decides to set priorities. I'm not saying they're wrong to, to go there. I get why they do. But that's why you need a public enforcement agency. Not one model along a, uh, a legal clinic role uh, as they are. Uh, the other thing is that the Legal Support Center, facing a barrage of more cases they could handle, came up with a solution in good faith to try to triage their work. And it's one that some think is a good idea, and I personally think is a bad idea. It's called unbundled legal services. Typically, when you go to a lawyer, you retain them, and they take you through the case. The Legal Support Center has decided to unbundle this so that if you go to them, they may say, look, we'll advise you on drafting your application, then you're on your own. Or we'll advise you on drafting your application, and we'll represent you on the mediation, but we won't commit now that we'll represent you after that. We might, we might not. But they're overloaded. They've got to ration their resources. I get that too. But the problem is you've got to view this through the eyes of a human rights complainant. Before you embark on a piece of litigation, especially one against a major organization that's going to get all lawyered up, you want to know with some confidence if you're going to be represented throughout. I described unbundled services like boarding a cruise ship at New York for London, but one that says, we promise we'll get you to the mid-Atlantic. When we get there, we'll let you know about whether we'll take you the rest of the way. And I just fundamentally think from the perspective of an organization trying to ration their services, I totally get it. But from the perspective of an equality-seeking applicant, that would be a real deterrence. Now, obviously, it's not a complete deterrence. Some people use their services. But what it can do is put undue pressure on a complainant at mediation to settle because they don't know that, the, that they're going to have a lawyer if they don't settle uh, or representation. It just seems to me logical. Um, there is um, one or two other problems uh, that I want to focus on. The new system uh, created a new problem, a new barrier for applicants, one that didn't exist under the old system. And it's the risk of costs being ordered against you. Now, let me be clear. The Human Rights Tribunal does not order and cannot order costs against an applicant. They couldn't before under the old system. They can't under the new system. So an applicant who brings a case forward, a complainant, uh, doesn't have to worry that if they lose, they're not only out of luck, but they're going to have to pay the other side's legal costs. Um, those who, from a respondent's perspective, don't like this system will say that's not fair because that means you can just, all you got to do is file a complaint and then the respondents have to run around and go lawyer up and <coughs> incur a lot of costs that if it's meritless, that's not fair. That's their argument on the side. But let me explain to you, and you got to remember that equality seeking folks, especially from the disability community, are disproportionately underemployed, unemployed, impoverished, so well, welfare defendant. The, running a risk of costs is not something appealing. I mean, not that it is for anybody, but it's especially risky of risk prone of being a uh, of being a barrier. So where's the cost burden in the new system? Well, it goes like this. Let's say you bring a human rights complaint, you as an individual. And let's say you go to the tribunal. And let's say you win. And let's say the respondent goes to court. It's not a right of appeal. It's called an application for judicial review. You'll learn about that in your administrative law course later in law school. But it's a chance to mount a legal challenge in court and say the tribunal got it, exceeded its jurisdiction or made reversible legal errors. Let's say the other side brings a judicial review application. You've then got to go to divisional court to defend it. And if you lose, the divisional court can order costs against you, the applicant, for the judicial review application. Pay for the other side, a portion of the other side's legal fees there. So let's say, let's roll this back. You go to the Human Rights Tribunal. You mount your case. You think you got a good case, but the tribunal finds for you but make some really boneheaded legal mistakes. And we got a great human rights tribunal, but having been a criminal appeal lawyer for 23 years, no court is immune from making mistakes that lead to reversals. Some of the best judges do. Heck, that's what kept us busy as appeal lawyers. So what happens? You argue your case, 
Leave it to the tribunal. They write their reasons and they make the legal errors. You can't control it. You can't stop it. But then the respondent takes you to divisional court. They persuade the divisional court that it was reversible error that should lead to a judicial review overturning. You got to pay the bill for the legals, for the other side, for errors made by the tribunal that you couldn't control. It's a new cost risk. And frankly, in a system like this, I'm going to give you a hypothetical. I can't point to a case where this has happened, but I'm going to give you a hypothetical. You could have a respondent who wins, or pardon me, a complainant who wins at the tribunal, and a respondent call up and say, look, we're, we're going to seek judicial review, and maybe we'll win and maybe we'll lose, but let's say we settle. The tribunal ordered a certain amount of money to you. Why don't we settle for half, and then we won't seek judicial review? You've got a financial burden for this. Now, under the old system, how did it work? Under the old system, you could actually appeal tribunal decisions to court. I argued a couple of those for the commission. But if there was a cost order, it was against, typically it was against the commission, not the individual. And at the tribunal, the tribunal could order costs against the commission if the case was frivolous or vexatious or brought in bad faith. The commission was a public law enforcement agency, and if it went off the rails by pursuing a case that, it sh that, that was really severely flawed, it could be exposed to cost, but that's the public purse, not the human rights complainant's pocket. So the new system, I've just walked you through a process that shows the new system created this, uh, created this, new, um, this new financial uh, barrier. Final critique of the, old, of the, of the reforms. And this one, I got to tell you, was really hard to ferret out and took a ton of pro bono volunteer hours to get to. When, they, when the breakfast clubbers, the folks who passionately advocated for Bill 107 and did a, an excellent job, I must say, at community organizing and advocating, I mean, they won the legislation. They came up with the idea, they sold it to the government as a good idea, and they persuaded them to adopt it, and they uh, with the number of us on the other side, uh, they, were, they were successful and we weren't. And I credit to them for, for the effective job they did. Um, um, the, uh, the, who did they point to, to draw media attention to their claim? They pointed to the discrimination complainants in the long lineup at the Human Rights Commission. They said there are thousands in line who have to wait for years. And it's not fair. Some of them just give up and others uh, are turned away after years, and a few get through. Some get settlements, and a few get a hearing. And what they said was, this new system is going to be so much better. So what we did is we said, OK, after three years, what happened to the people in the lineup? What happened to the people that were in the lineup the day the new system started? Now, again. Lepofsky puts on community organizing hat. When Bill 107 was first introduced, the plan was they had to have a transition plan. What do we do with the new law when the new law goes into effect? Well, the, the government's initial proposal, Michael Bryant, the Attorney General's initial proposal was anybody in the old system immediately had to jump to the new system. And what that meant was you could have been in that lineup for seven years, but unless you were in the middle of a human rights tribunal hearing, you had to start all over again with no Human Rights Commission investigation, get your own lawyer, get started all over. And what we said to the government is not only is that a really bad idea as a matter of public policy, but it's a really good idea for us as a matter of community organizing, because we will try to make sure that there are TV cameras at the Human Rights Tribunal the day it starts, and you will love to see the coverage of hundreds, if not thousands, of human rights applicants who are just so thrilled at what you just did to them. Well, the government got sort of them. We proposed that the better solution was to let the old system run its course for the old applicants, and the new system would be available for any new cases. It made sense. Well, the government didn't want to go all that way. They went part way. They created a transition regime where for a certain number of months, if you were in the old system, this is a certain number of months after Bill 107 was passed, you had the choice. You could stay at the commission, see if your case could get resolved. 
or go right to the tribunal under the new privatized regime. But after that transition period, everybody goes to the new system, even the, those in the backlog. So we said, what happened? And we tried to track the cases. And we found that a whole bunch of people stayed at the commission, commission adopted an expedited process, and cleared through, resolved a substantial number of them. And a certain number jumped to the tribunal, but what we found was that 885 of the 4,000 or so cases in that backlog, when Bill 107 was enacted, just vanished. Their cases weren't resolved, their cases didn't go forward. Almost 20% of the very people, almost 25% of the very people, uh, who were the core public focus of the victims of the old system, were lost in the new system. Moreover, the Human Rights Legal Support Center, for understandable reasons of managing its resources, said it would not advise anybody in the old system. It had to start afresh with people in the new system. So there were 885 people who vanished, weren't served, and there was no one there to help them after uh, the transition was over. And we said, that's just not fair. And by the way, ferreting those numbers out took hours of trying to get disclosures and then trying to compare numbers. So it's enough to whine, as I do. But what about a solution? So we, we presented these problems to, to the Pinto Review. We said, we got a solution. And it's a solution that will bring the opponents and the proponents of Bill 107 together. It will draw on all of our concerns where none becomes a loser. And it's a solution that we have an actual proof it works. What's the solution? We said, let's do a hybrid. Why don't you recommend a hybrid between the pre-Bill 107 regime, the public enforcement regime, and the post-Bill 107 regime, the private regime. Call it a hybrid. What does that mean? You want to bring a discrimination case, you got a choice. You can apply to the Human Rights Commission and use the old system, or you can go right to the tribunal and represent yourself, or try to get the Human Rights Legal Support Center to help you. And we said that would let people vote with their feet, or if you will, with their wheels, if they use a wheelchair. That was a joke, by the way. Um, and what that would mean is, people who want the public enforcement option, they've got it, but if they don't like it, or don't want to wait for it, or they can get their own representation, Use the privatized regime. That will cover everybody. Now, that would then end the debate between the breakfast clubbers and the supper clubbers. It's like a lunch solution. But we said, not only is it hypothetical, we had a couple of years of experience with it because that was the transition regime that the government implemented. Remember I said that during the transition, those in the backlog had the choice of staying with the commission that adopted reformed procedures and those who want to go directly to the tribunal. And at least then we saw a whole lot of people stayed with the commission as we had called for, the commission reformed its process, as we called for, there was a funding injection and guess what? They blew out the backlog. Now, obviously I'd want a better system so 885 people don't vanish, but still, it's a complete solution. So what did Mr. Pinto do? He found a lot of the problems that we identified, that, that all sides acknowledge. That, the, that uh, too many people were unrepresented, that the system was too complicated, that the tribunal rules were too complicated. Uh, he said uh, that, and you can read his report, I don't wanna, whatever I say is gonna be an oversimplification, I'll be accused of skewing it, uh, but uh, in any event, he concluded that uh, the Human Rights Commission was not bringing enough systemic cases to represent the public interest and so on. However, despite all of that, he called the system a qualified success and there's a consensus of support in favor of it. He said, whoa, consensus of who? Qualified success, we didn't agree with. And in the one finding that I would take the strongest exception with, when he pointed to the government's uh, promise of free lawyers for every uh, applicant, he essentially said, well, some might read it that way, but in any event, the government, by passing an amendment rejecting it, 
during clause by clause debates, there was no promise. Our answer was, a promise is a promise and doesn't become a no promise because one side unilaterally says, sorry, changed my mind. So what do we do now? I conclude with a couple of observations. I conclude by saying we still need significant reform in our human rights system and we've now got um, seven or eight years experience that are worth studying. Our brief to the Pinto Review in, in 2012 and our critique of the Pinto Review's report, which are all going to be linked to this lecture, provide an indication of where we were then. We did an independent review to take a look at where we are now. And I think it's worth looking at the system and going for the hybrid option uh, that we proposed. I think it's worth looking at some of the reforms we said to immunize complainants from this unfair cost barrier. It's worth looking at the system uh, from the perspective of uh, undoing the harm to people with disabilities of the government um, flip-flop on whether we'd have an independent enforcement agency for the Disabilities Act. We're still pressing for that uh, to this day uh, without, without any hesitation. Uh, and it's worth looking at the hybrid option. And finally, it's worth looking at the Human Rights Commission, frankly, proving me wrong bringing as many or more cases than there were under the old system to show that a, a public agency targeting public uh, recurring problems can make a huge difference. Uh, when it comes to the Commission developing policies on human rights, that's all well and good, but people aren't, some will follow those policies, but they won't be taken really seriously by as many if, they, if obligated organizations uh, don't fear effective enforcement. So I conclude with that. We started just saying, isn't equality rights going to be interesting to study? I conclude by telling you, you're going to find equality rights really interesting to study. And underlying it, though, what will pervade you, your thinking about it, I hope, is that debating what those rights mean is one thing. But discussing how they're enforced is equally interesting, equally important, and equally essential. Thank you very much.